if you're a weak insight into the hallowed halls of the ivory tower i'm chris with me as always is steven i'm here and this week we have special guest dr sarah silkey associate professor of history at lycoming college Hello. Well, sarah thank you welcome so we're happy we're excited to have you uh, because we have a guest, I feel like we should probably say this time that, you know, our opinions that are expressed here are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of our institutions. This is how we keep Sarah from getting in trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. This episode is on sabbaticaling, which is a verb I recently made up um, from the word sabbatical. I suppose it's a verb. Don't ask me. I'm a physics professor, not an English professor. I'm going with adverb. Uh, you want to go with adverb? I do. Yeah. It's, you're probably right. Here's the thing, though. Like, you know, I'm a child of the 80s, which meant that I only had grammar up to second grade. <laughs> and then, and then we, had, we had grammar books in second grade. And then in third grade, no more grammar books. It was like, you don't have to learn that anymore. Okay. So there we are. That's why I picked physics. All right. <laughs> So, this topic today, how to have a successful sabbatical, or at least how to try to have a successful sabbatical, you know, or not. Uh, Sarah and I are still mid-sabbatical right now, so we're not sure if we're going to have a successful one or not. We hope we do. So, so point to note, uh, if you want to have a su uh, successful sabbatical, apparently appear on our show. That, that's a good way to, to make that happen. Yes. yes. Oh, I got the box ticked then. Yeah, Great. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> You have fulfilled your sabbatical contract. Congratulations, Sarah. <laughs> I wish it had been that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, although most of our listeners are probably academics or academics uh, sort of in the making, we should probably comment real quickly on what sabbatical is and what sabbatical is not. So about every seven years or so, depending on your institution, you can request to get relieved of your administrative and teaching duties and pursue professional development. Typically research, but, you know, that can take different forms. And um, so that little period of time, whether semester or a year, is called sabbatical. What is sabbatical not? It is not vacation. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a really, really highly established person and just feel like taking a vacation. But for the most part, no, it's not. No. It, it's kind of like makeup time. <laughs> mm. And uh, unless, of course, you're like really established and you're getting ready to retire. And you can take a sabbatical and just say, oh, the hell with it. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. It's not any of us. No, no, I'm not definitely not. That I'm ever planning to do something like that. I'm just saying that if if one could, you know, <laughs> so. hypothetically. So, uh, how one goes about getting a sabbatical, other than time in, varies, of course, from institution to institution. Um, well, let's, let's clarify and, that first point, actually, before we go any further. Um, sure. You know, I I don't know about you, Sarah. Uh, is Lycoming your only job, or have you been elsewhere? I've taught other places, but this okay. is the only tenured okay. position that I've ever had. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So one of the things that's really important for that time in question is uh, the vast majority of places are time in at the university. Uh, mm -hmm. So not just time in and career. Uh, I did four years at my first institution. And when I came to my current one, I actually had to restart the clock, which was not great. Uh, that meant I basically went 10 years before my first sabbatical. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you can sometimes negotiate that if you change jobs. But for the most part, that is a you are here in residence at this university for six to seven years. Um, so, okay, continue on there, Chris. Oh, yeah, I ran into the same thing. Uh, this is year 12 for me <laughs> in a tenure track line. This is my first possible sabbatical because right. I had four years somewhere else. You couldn't take the time in. Right. I was told when I interviewed that, that I was not allowed to transfer time from sabbatical in. Um, at the time, I was told because that was an AAUP thing. So, don't know. I'm just, this is what I was told. So, I'm like, yeah, whatever. It didn't matter to me. Uh, at the time, I just wanted the job. So, um, well, anyway. Some, some places have, um, like, like mid-assistant uh, sabbaticals and so mm -hmm. forth. So, this is this yeah. can't be a, a, a hard and fast rule. It has to be something that is flexible at an institution-by-institution institution basis. I think typically, though, the institutions that provide pre-tenure sabbaticals are ones that um, demand a higher level of uh, publication record mm -hmm. 
prior to tenure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that in those cases, you really can't make sufficient progress with the, the teaching load and service, et cetera, that's expected um, without having that time away from the institution to be able to get that first book out in the humanities or um, get substantial research done in the, in the sciences. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I, I, would, I would have loved to have had a pre-tenure sabbatical. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That would have been awesome. So, you know, typically what you do is you, you apply. If you get the sabbatical, um, you basically tell your, your institution what you're going to accomplish or what you intend to accomplish. Uh, if you get it, then you get a contract, which basically says, you know, you will be away for the following time and you will do the following things. And then you sign that off and, um, you know, we'll see how it goes from there, I guess, since we're mid-sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, actually, we weren't even that formal. It was, I submitted a... I think a three page document and it's reviewed by a college committee and they came back and said, yes, you're approved. And that was the extent to which I had anything. Um, mm -hmm. And right now it's a rubber stamp after it was taken over about 10 years ago by a senior professor who said, why are you denying sabbaticals to research productive people? Stop doing that. Uh, so now they basically rubber stamp for everybody as long as they are research productive. Oh, nice. Nice. I've been told of places where you actually have to go away. Like you're not allowed to take sabbatical unless you are um, going to go somewhere other than the institution you're at. That would fit with something like a Fulbright or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, right. But if you're just more, it's interesting. I didn't know that that would be a case for every, for, for the, you know, direct sabbatical kind of an idea. Yeah. That's just what I've been told by a colleague um, at another institution. So very interesting. But anyway, the point is different places, different policies. Yes. yes. I know at the place that I taught before I came to like coming um, in conversations with the faculty there, their system was fairly different in that uh, if you were a, a tenured member of the faculty, you would earn your time to sabbatical just for pedagogical projects. Mm. Um, you'd automatically get one semester to, uh, to pursue pedagogy. Um, but if you wanted to have a full year, then you had to come up with a research project that would be moving towards some kind of publication. So the, I think the standards vary quite a bit based on the the goals and the focus of the institution. Yeah. Well, at our school, which is a research institution, we actually have for our clinical faculty, you know, the, the, the faculty who are on a, uh, a teaching load, purely teaching load, do have sabbaticals as well. So you can do pedagogical mm -hmm. ones for that, uh, as well as um, it's possible to do uh, uh, not just scholarly output, but you can do textbook development and things mm -hmm. like that. So they're actually providing a lot of different things. You just have to be clear of what you want to deliver at the end of this. Yeah, I'd say it's probably the single best perk of being a college professor. <laughs> Every seventh year, you, you get to sort of, you know, take a step back and recoup and uh, reorganize and uh, sort of just, you know, catch up. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a refreshing thing. All right, so I um, thought what we'd do is maybe before we talk about, uh, well, why don't we talk about funding? Uh, I don't have that in, in that order in our show notes, but why don't we jump ahead of there? Um, Stephen, have you ever attempted to get funding for sabbatical? So as a half-year sabbatical, I qualified as just my, my salary, so there was no loss in that way. Uh, I right. was given opportunities to actually be sponsored at a couple different places, um, it ended up that I ended up doing none of those because my family didn't want to uproot for, for four months. Um, mm -hmm. But I had two different countries, essentially, I could have gone to. And at the institutions, they would have put me up for various things. And if I'd wanted to, to teach on top of that, uh, they were willing to pay me for that. Um, I just, again, at the end of the day, because I chose not to travel for the most part, the only time that I traveled was for two weeks uh, to another institution. But that was, that was it. I basically worked back here. I, I, didn't, I didn't move anywhere. How about you, Sarah? Um, I actually didn't pursue outside funding for this sabbatical. I uh, recently published my first book, um, Black Women Reformer, Ida B. Wells, Lynching yes. and Transatlantic Activism. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and having finished that big project, I really wasn't um, far enough along in my research moving into my next project to be able to make you know viable applications for funding at different institutions. And so I decided to forego that and uh, take the pay cut to have the, the full year off at half pay rather than um, trying to figure out a way to get funding that really didn't fit with where I was at in the in the process. Sure, sure. Uh, I tried 
a few things, struck out largely. I uh, found a couple of places that fund sabbatical specifically. I found a couple of places, I did a couple of research grant sort of um, traditional research grant kind of things that didn't pan out. So I took the year at half pay and just saved up ahead of time, took it. And I'm really glad I did the year. Yeah, me too. Even though I'm like three months in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad because it's just, yeah, it's, it's given me a lot of opportunity to do things. We'll talk about that though in a moment. So you did so, calendar yeah. year though, as opposed to academic year. Yes. I chose to do the same. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting because I'm not sure that we would actually have that opportunity. This would be a academic year and it's constrained within that space. That was another thing that made trying to find funding awkward for me because most of the fellowships I was looking at were year long fellowships and residence. And so um, to try to get one for just the correct semester that I needed um, severely limited what would be available. Fair enough. Yeah, and it, but it gave me two chances at one foundation, but they tend to sort of fund bigger schools. So that was just not going to happen on my end. I do have to go on public record and say the calendar year was Sarah's idea. She's, <laughs> her, her and I were coming to the same year. She's like, oh, I should consider calendar year. I'm like, oh, yeah, I see the benefits. Okay, let's do it. Uh, 2016, so, the year of uh, Chris and Sarah. There you go. Yep, exactly. <laughs> All right, we don't need to spread further rumors oh, about well, us. Not, so. not that way. That's not what I'm suggesting. No, 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 no. This is an entirely different program going that direction. Let's, let's not do that. Salacious a academic lives. That would be a great podcast topic, though. Or actually, a great podcast. Salacious academic lives. That could be the title. Um, so, back to sabbaticals. Uh <laughs> Let's talk about a few things that um, you know, maybe we found to be successful so far and things that maybe we haven't um, gotten to work while on sabbatical. Um, I know Stephen and I have talked you know, separately about this before and the importance of um, sort of getting away, whether that means getting away from home or getting away from the office. Mm -hmm. And that sort of depends on family and personal dynamics of what you can do. Um, but um, Stephen, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, I, I think the biggest advantage of the sabbatical is that you're allowing yourself to not fall into the regular routines. You know, if you go into the office all the time, if you are, you know, showing up for uh, meetings, if you're doing all the other stuff that you're involved with, well, you can't step back. I mean, all of us are struggling for time as is. We don't have enough time. We, d we can't move on what we want to do because something else comes up. Somebody stops in by your office. Somebody wants to talk about this. All those kinds of things. If you can't stop that, you have wasted your sabbatical. Uh, and, and that's a real challenge. I mean, for me, that was one of the problems is I did have to go to my office. I couldn't work from home. I have two young kids, you know, one at home. Uh, it wasn't a, so a situation for me to really work from here. So I had to find a way to basically say is, I'm in my office. Don't talk to me. Um, there's, you know, basically sign on the door. I'm on sabbatical. Go away. Uh, and that mostly worked, though, um, you know, again, I, I did leave my office. I, strangely enough, had to use the restroom or things like that from time to time. Um, it's dangerous. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you suddenly lose time or somebody says, you know, it, I know you're on sabbatical, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's the worst possible situation because they've already acknowledged your, your comeback. You know, yep. uh, my excuse for not doing this right now is because I'm on sabbatical, but you tried to dismiss that. Uh, and, and that's a challenge. So, yeah, I mean, you have to to whatever extent you can get away is a plus. I mean, I, I guess we're all sort of here, you know, in the sense of we're actually at our institutions right now. But if you can work from home, uh, if you can, you know, travel at all. And again, I, with my next sabbatical, I expect to travel. The children will be old enough that I, I can get up and move for three months without too much of a problem or five months or whatever that might be. Uh, and they'll be able to immerse themselves in whatever culture. Um, you know, I've, I've had colleagues who would... <laughs> One of our current faculty, his first job, uh, he actually graduated from our institution. He was, he was elsewhere, and his first sabbatical, he actually came back to this town, uh, rented a house, um, and, you know, just sort of had his head down and did work during that time. But it was a nice idea of just, that's forcibly removing yourself from your town. It was a four-hour drive to his office. He wasn't going to his office. <laughs> Excellent. How about you, Sarah, about uh, being away? Well, I've uh, had the advantage of getting kicked out of my office um, because I have a sabbatical replacement who is teaching my classes right now, um, which I am extremely happy about because that gives me a break from teaching, particularly my high-load introductory courses. 
Um, but it also means that I, I really can't go into the office and use my office. So um, home has been my uh, my place to work, um, which has its advantages and disadvantages. On the one hand, you know, yoga pants and pajama bottoms are a regular feature in my life at the moment. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, because I, I live alone, it gets kind of uh, samey after a while. There's just uh, too much of me and not enough of other people. So trying to um, set up things like lunch dates and uh, go down and visit my partner, um, things like that to just break up the week so that I'm not just with myself. I mean, my company is great, but there's a point at which it gets a little boring talking to me. Um, so I, I try to mix it up. Um, but uh, it actually has been really good for me. It was it was hard at first to give up my office and feel kind of kicked out. Um, but then I saw the, the genius of it, which is I can't go in and work there. Um, so I've got that forced separation, um, which helps a lot. And the, and the guy who's uh, filling in for me, Matt, is fantastic. And uh, if I, you know, I pop in to pick up my mail and stuff, uh, you know, he's always very you know, congenial and it's very nice, but uh, I find even just going in to get my mail on campus can be a 30 minute trip <laughs> or a two hour yeah. trip, depending yeah. on who I run into and what's going on. So um, I try to find off hours to uh, to make my little journeys into the, uh, the office, but for the most part, I try to stay away. Those 2 a.m. Uh, mail trips, that's a good choice. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. my colleagues work too hard because wow. they're most of them are pre tenure. So, um, in my in my department, and so they are they are there at odd hours as well. It's like Ugh, oh. go home. <laughs> yeah, I had the fortune of not being an experimental scientist, so I get to work from home. Absolutely loving it. I thought I was going crazy by now. I have yet to go crazy, at least that I'm aware of. And so, uh, yeah, I, I I have to go in about once a week to work with my research students. And I do get those conversations of, hey, I know you're on sabbatical, but <laughs> but I get most of them through email. That's good. And so I can just, you know, choose to ignore those as necessary uh, or reply, you're right, I am on sabbatical. <laughs> it's, it's right, you know. What do you think that means? Uh, so, yeah, uh, the working from home thing I think has been critical for me getting stuff done um, because it just, you're right, you're not being bothered all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a place you can hide. And... Uh, yeah, so far, you know, like um, Sarah said, making lunch arrangements, stuff like that has kind of helped me get social. Plus, you know, having to go in any way to meet with my research students once a week has been uh, sort of a way of just, you know, not going crazy in the house by myself. Um, Though that does have a, a general statement that's pr uh, beyond sabbatical. Some people like to work from home, and those of you who you know who are listening who want that that space, be aware you run into the same problems. You run into the possibility of suddenly disconnecting, of you know having a puppet show or something like that. Uh, whatever it is that you need to be entertained, I think that's where Sarah was going with that actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know you. you you need to find a routine that works for you that allows you to balance. I mean, there's enough research that talks about the idea that you need some social interaction in order to handle stress, um, make things a lot more just uh, possible. And given that, that our careers are ones with lots of negative feedback and the like, lack of interaction can be detrimental to one's health. Uh, so mm. whatever you want to do, both on a sabbatical or, or even in general in your life, find a way to, to have some social interaction beyond just getting your head down and doing some work and talking to random people on podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're a physicist or a mathematician, then this is our sort of our native habitat right. by ourselves with our heads down. Anyway, so uh, – <laughs> yeah, actually, you hit on a good point, Stephen. Keeping a schedule is important, whether it's a social schedule or a work schedule mm – -hmm. Uh, I found that I've been able to be successful so far and get things done because I have sort of a work day mapped out for each day of the week. I don't know specifically what I'm doing every day, but I do know that I'm going to start working at, you know, let's say 930 in the morning and I'm going to work until, let's say, 3, 4, or whatever, or whatever work is done, I'm going to work. And that kind of helps me stay focused. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. so much more regimented than I am. <laughs> I can't yeah, do that. <laughs> I'm a super regimented person. I mean, you're talking to a guy that has a pretty detailed five-year plan. So, you know, I that's just how I have to live. I, I can't I can't help it. But but there is something to be said. One again, one of those challenges are how well do you want to be distracted? Oh, I'm kind of tired today. I don't really, you know, it's a hard day getting up. Those yoga pants aren't fitting as well as I'd like. <laughs> um, you know, what's on TV? Um, 
you know, you run that risk of, of doing Ooh. that. And so having a plan for what do I need to do today, this week, this month, whatever it might be. Again, you don't have to have really drilled down kinds of stuff. I, I, maybe, maybe Chris does, but the rest of us wouldn't say, you know, I'm going to write this chapter this week. Uh, or I'm going to have this specific conversation or this, you know, research uh, test that I'm going to run or whatever it might be. It, that might be going a little far. Well, okay, so I guess I go a little far then because it's pretty much exactly what I do. <laughs> but you do that during your normal working life anyway. I mean, you oh, yeah. always are very careful to set aside specific blocks of time to continue doing your research, which is something I cannot do during the semester because teaching and service consumes me um, during the semester, which is why my breaks are so important and the sabbatical is so important to be able to, to dive back into it. Um, you're able to kind of chunk things and make yourself focus on what you need to and you don't necessarily forget what you've been working on whereas I need to dive in immerse myself and really push through it otherwise I lose pieces along the way and so um, I think your process just fits really well with being regimented I, I know talking to other faculty about you know before I started sabbatical I asked a lot of people how do I do this well what are the top tips and the things that they all told me stay away from the office don't talk to anyone don't agree to do anything for the college period um, and then uh, make sure that you're doing something every day and um, it, and so for some of them that was nine o'clock I'm going to the coffee shop I'm going to be there for two hours and then you know whatever happens after that great but at least I've gotten that chunk in. Um, but, uh, you know, your process is just very much chunked like that. I mean, you've been, uh, you've been kicking my butt in terms of productivity over sabbatical. I'm still playing catch up, trying to get all the little stupid things that I agreed to do because I'm an idiot um, off of my plate so that I can really dive in and immerse myself in my, in my sources again. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's just part of it. You have to, um, on the one hand, push yourself to make sure that you stay on target and, and make, uh, make progress, but you also have to be true to who you are and how you work as well. And I think that um, sort of taking a little bit of time to plan at the beginning of sabbatical to figure out, okay, let's be honest with myself. What are my weaknesses? What are my strengths in terms of my, my productivity and my workflow? And how can I make this work for myself rather than pushing against, um, against type? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, yeah, know yourself, know what, go in with a plan, know what you want to get done. Absolutely. I actually have three pages of plans, um, but <laughs> I spent a week working on it. So anyway, uh, yeah, it's getting a little crazy. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think that's great. You know, know yourself, set realistic goals, keep that schedule, and just stay the hell out of work. See, you no, know, there, there's a codicil we want to, I have to put on that, which is, you know, be, being true to yourself, sometimes that actually says, means saying yes to things too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we were recruiting for a faculty member and, you know, the answer should be, no, I'm not going to attend. I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to do whatever. But the other side of that is, well, this is a future colleague. I want to be a part of this. I need to be something. Yep. I'm going to skip a lot of this, but I actually need to come in to meet with this person. I need to see their job talk, et cetera. And you don't have to do that on sabbatical. But if that's something that's valuable to you, you should actually still say yes. So don't make it a blanket no to everything. It should be your default answer to everything is no. And then you can back off from time to time. But don't back off on everything. Yeah, I totally agree. Because, I, I mean, I've been in the same situation where I've, I've had to go in and address a couple of things here and there. But, yeah, no should be the default answer. Um, I agree. Good colleagues, I, I, hopefully they, they understand that and they won't actually be asking you for things. You know, if, they, if they've been on sabbatical recently, they recognize the value of it, too. Yes. I think that's one of the things that's been really valuable to me is that the chair of my department is um, a few years ahead of me. And so he's had his sabbatical and he's getting ready for his next one. So who's going to be chair next? Um, and, and so one of the things I've noticed is that he's been very careful in trying to preserve my time and my space and make sure that uh, as many things are taken off of my plate as possible. I'm sure part of that is to set the standard and the expectations for when he's on sabbatical. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's great to have people who, who recognize that and take your, you know, have your back and trying to help smooth the way. But there are things that you just 
you need to be there for. Um, and uh, like I have, uh, I was able to pass off all of my advisees to second advisors so that they can get through the, the time that I'm, I'm on sabbatical. Um, but, you know, I've been working with these students for years and uh, they're like, please, please, please come to graduation. It's like, okay, I'm not going to walk, but I will come and, you know, talk to you at the tent afterwards and have some lemonade and take pictures with your family um, because they're, you know, that's important to me. Yeah, I've had to be more proactive in protecting my time. I haven't had sort of uh, the shields um, mm -hmm. that sort of you've mentioned, Sarah. Um, so I've had to be a bit more aggressive with, with saying no. Um, but again, you know, when I get back, I'll have to deal with issues. And so I need to be, you know, in the game some. Um, I suppose if you're going to graduation, I'll go to graduation too. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting worse by the moment. <laughs> uh, also, you guys are invited to our graduation if you'd like to come by. But uh, oh, fantastic! No. <laughs> one, one a year is, is is more than enough for me. I'm good. Thank you, though. I appreciate your kindness and the offer. Um, so yeah, you know, I think what we've done. I think we. I had things I will talk about things that work and things that don't work. And we did a pretty good job of of combining those two things together. Um, I guess you know the point is enjoy it. Um, it's catch up and just, you know, get done what you want to get done and, uh, protect yourself. There's a really the, uh, I think the advice that I have for, uh, the for one other thing you have in here that I want to be very clear about is the realistic expectations. You know, you say establish oh, realistic yeah. goals. I think it's a really important thing. Your sabbatical, while a wonderful thing, isn't a situation in which you will publish 12 books, cure cancer mm -hmm. and split the atom again. Um, well, I have cured cancer so far. I'm just keeping it to myself. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. Yeah. But you haven't written 12 <laughs> books. You know, no, no, no. That's, that's what the next six months are for. Right. Okay. Um, you, know, I, you know, on the lines of that, I, I, I think, um, yes, we need to make sure that what we're trying to do is possible. And, and it's, it's just like summer, right? Summer always seems like it's going to be the, the solution to everything that got pushed off for the last nine months. Um, and then you find out that you can only get through a quarter of the list that you came up with your, for yourself on the first day of, of summer. Um, and it's the same thing with, with sabbatical. But I think sometimes we get too focused um, on the, the strictly professional development in terms of um, professional production. Right. And I, and I think, um, I don't know, I was reading a, a blog post from Hope Jaron. She's a, a, a geological scientist. And uh, she was writing about um, kind of making a call for tenured professors to, um, to step up and use tenure for good to try to change the world. And one of the things that she uh, talked about in there was the importance of sabbatical for disengaging from the routine that you've been in and giving you an opportunity to sort of take stock and make a new plan, um, identify new principles for how you want to proceed for the next portion of your career, um, and to start setting performance standards that are internally set rather than externally set. And I think particularly for that transition from being an untenured professor to a recently tenured professor to what do I do now, I think sabbatical is a really important time to be able to make that kind of adjustment to decide what's most important to you, what are the things that you're going to hang on to, what are the things that you're going to let go of when you go back so that you can prioritize other things that maybe you haven't been able to spend time focusing on because of the demands of trying to get through the tenure process. So I think sometimes, um, although I feel a little bit guilty that I haven't made as much progress as Chris, uh, I also needed some headspace time to, to start figuring out what I wanted to do and what's important to me and and really what I want to have my life be like when I go back to my college and start teaching again what do I what do I want that to look like and feel like I think that's that's fantastic you know it should be a time of reflection and taking risks and you know turning left you know and all that kind of stuff of you know there is something to be said about it. it's just a time to, to move forward on your work, but mm -hmm. there is something about just have a point of, of reflection. You know, that's why I was recommending traveling. It's one of the, the things that I have in the show notes is it, it forces you out of your routine. I think that's a big part mm -hmm. of it. You know, Chris likes his routine and is going to codify all of his days <laughs> for the next, let's say, 10 years. Um, but breaking Only the routine five. allows you to also be more creative. That's one of the downsides of a routine is that it's, it's constraining. Um, mm -hmm. if you can, you know, you can exploit very well within a routine, but you can explore outside of a routine. So it's, it is a good idea to think about it that way. 
I appreciate sure. that, Mozart. Part part of my routine too is is actually been what Sarah has pointed out. You know, part of my three page plan is one of them is personal, right? I've got three pages: professional, personal, and then there's some other stuff. And and you know, sort of like other stuff. <laughs> yeah, other stuff. Well, yeah, and you know, and it's things like you know, personal things in my life that I want to get sorted out or figured out, mm-hmm. or you know, maybe things I want to learn. Like you know, do I want to learn how to play the piano? Something I've been messing around with, although I haven't touched it in a while. Um, and these kind of personal enrichment things, again, it's all part of, you know, resetting that self, um, exploring other options, other possibilities, not just professionally, but also personally. And we have, we have this time, this block of time, and, you know, I can spend it all day working, uh, or I can spend it all day playing video games, uh, but I like to try to, you know, somewhere in between where I'm, you know, doing stuff for me, but also doing stuff professionally as well. All right, so your sabbatical is 80% video games, 20%... You know, it's... Curing yeah. Cancer. No, I'd say it's 60% video games, 20% curing cancer, and the rest is writing books. Okay. You know? Good, good. <laughs> and that's just the first six months. I mean, who knows what I'll do the next six months. Good. Wonderful. All right. Yes. So, those are sabbatical. I mean, we could probably go on and on about sabbatical but uh, i think the longer we go the the punchier we get so there we go uh i think we will go ahead and wrap this up sarah since you are our guest what would you decide uh would you like to plug your book again or something else <laughs> um i don't know it was just fun to be on the show i appreciate the invitation and uh and also getting a chance to sort of um force myself to think a little bit about what I'm doing and how to articulate that to other people. Um, so this has been, it's been a lot of fun. We've ha- enjoyed having you here. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Go buy her book. It's on Amazon. Sarah Silk, <laughs> go check it out. All right, <laughs> everybody until next time, let's get back to writing. <laughs>